Welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the first week of Epiphany. Yeah, first week. Thank you for being here. Sorry, I just was looking at the bulletin for the second Sunday in Epiphany. So, um, right. So, our scriptures for today, we will be using, uh, come on, paper. Uh, psalm number 89, not the whole psalm, uh, verses 1 through 18. Uh, we're going to move into Isaiah chapter 41, and we'll also start Ephesians chapter 2. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn and make them our own in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's begin our liturgy. Hmm. There we go. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O oh, come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. All right. Psalm number 89. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and south, you've created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand. High your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face who exult in your name all the day and in your righteousness are exalted. 
for you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. <clears throat> Oops, wrong book. Pardon me. Well, guess we'll have to use the backup. My apologies. Let us pray. Mighty God, in fulfillment of the promise you made to David's descendants, you established a lasting covenant through your firstborn son. You anointed your servant Jesus with holy oil and raised him higher than all kings on earth. Remember your covenant so that we who are signed with the blood of your son may sing of your mercies forever. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Wow. Oh, this is an interesting book. This is the, it's called the Minister's Desk Edition. This is the, the uh, personal version of the big altar book that sits up on the altar. And it has a few things in it that um, normal hymnals don't have, like a prayer for each psalm. I usually use out of my devotional book, which I seem to have set aside somewhere. Oh, boy. Anyway. So. But there's always something special in here that it has to teach me. So any chance I have to pick it up is a good thing. All right. Whoops. <laughs> so. Our first lesson is from Isaiah 41, and we'll read verses 1 through 16. Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach, then let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. Who stirred up one from the east, whom victory meets at every step? He gives up nations before him, so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely. By paths his feet have not trod. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and come. Everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong. The craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, and he who smooths with the hammer, him who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth, and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. 
Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them. You shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the tempest shall scatter them. And you shall rejoice in the Lord, in the Holy One of Israel. You shall glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, <clears throat> all right, that was kind of a long passage. Let's see. But I hope you heard it. This is definitely the theme of this chapter. Fear not, for I'm with you, right? Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. What are we doing here? So Gentile nations are called into the courtroom before the Lord and given the chance to renew their strength. That's the Gentile nations. Just as Israel is given that opportunity in this verse. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, right? They're renewing their strength. Now, the coastlands are also Gentile, okay? They border the sea. Um, let those peoples renew their strength and together draw near for judgment, okay? <clears throat> The question is simple. Who is ultimately in charge of world events? That's what we're talking about. Who stirred up one from the East? Whom victory meets at every step? Well, who did that? This is the identity of one stirred up for service, but it is intentionally vague. Might mean Abraham, Moses, Joshua, or someone else. It certainly fits the Persian King Cyrus. After becoming King of Persia and Media, Medea, Cyrus marched west to Lydia on the coast of the Great Sea, subduing it and intervening peoples, and all the intervening peoples. The campaigns from the north, he conquered, conquered Babylon. So where it says he, he gives up nations before him, the literal translation there is gives before him nations, as though casting them down just to trample on them, right? So that he tramples kings underfoot. That's pretty powerful. Makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. The conqueror's advance was so swift that he did not, his feet did not seem to touch the paths leading to his victims, right? His path, paths, his feet have not trod. Like he, he went through so quickly, his feet barely touched the ground. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning, calling them into existence, and calling them to face his judgment? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. All right, so the Lord's sovereign power is again affirmed. He is the first, back to the last chapter, verse 28, the Lord is the everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth. So he was the first. I, the Lord, am the first, <clears throat> and will be with the last ones of the earth. The Lord predates the beginning of history and will continue to exist after the last of temporal things has ceased to be. In all this, he does not change. He doesn't change. So distant nations gather in panic at Cyrus's advance, right? The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They've drawn near and come. They're afraid of Cyrus. The coastlands feel panic, but continue to finish work on their idols to make them firm before God's presence. Well, that's not good. This, that's what this is. Building idols to give them confidence. All right. Okay, so, but you, Israel, my servant... This unmerited distinction for Abraham and his offspring to be chosen of all the families on the earth and to be given a role in God's eternal plan of salvation. My servant, whom I have chosen, the Lord is speaking here, right? Jacob, whom I have chosen, offspring of Abraham, my friend, okay? 
Abraham was faithful to God. He is the picture of faith. For all who come after him, they lift him up as he, when they think of faith, they use Abraham as their example. This nation who came from him, you whom I took from the ends of the earth. Abraham originally came from an area called Ur, near the natural boundaries of the Persian Gulf and the Zagros Mountains. Israel, my servant, was Israel was to act as a kingdom of priests to the whole world. At Sinai, Israel is distinctly marked and empowered to be evangelistic, to carry out the good news. The nation is commissioned to be the go-between concerning the Lord and all the nations, the nations other than Israel. That is Israel's calling. I took you from the ends of the earth. I called you from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you. Israel, I've not cast you off. I have chosen you. Fear not, for I am with you. When I am with you, you have nothing to be afraid of. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Right? Capital G. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is a promise. Behold, all who, are, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. When God is with you, no one can prevail against you. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. All right. This is something new going on here. Let's, let's slow down here. Uh... God's right hand fights for his people in power. While his left, with his left hand, he holds the right hand of his child Israel. Because of our sinful nature, here we go. Because our sinful nature is hesitant to believe that there is nothing whatsoever to fear if God says, I am with you, he must say again and again, fear not, and strengthen our faith. It's our sin that causes us to doubt, right? Yeah. He must say again and again, fear not. And he does. Fear not, for I am with you. So his right hand is doing this. His left hand is holding Israel's right hand. It's I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Okay. Here's another fear not. Not good. Israel is compared to a worm and their enemies to mountains. Only with the Lord can a worm crush mountains. <laughs> Occurring more than 10 times in the following chapters, the, the comforting title of God, Redeemer, describes what he must do to rescue his helpless people. So here he is. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Okay. Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge. This is formed with several heavy timbers tied together with sharp rocks or metal driven into its underside, and it's used to separate grain from husks and stalks. This likens the destruction of nations or enemies to the same physical circumstances as grain when it is threshed. Israel's enemies will be worn, crushed, and scattered to the winds. That's exactly what he describes. New and sharp and having teeth, you will thresh, thresh the mountains and crush them, make the hills like chaff. Winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away. The tempest will scatter them. And you shall rejoice in the Lord, and the Holy One of Israel you shall glory. Because this little worm will thresh these mountains. All right, and that is the end of our passage today. So let's move to Ephesians. And we are in Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 10, which is just right here. Okay. 
And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, Paul and his famously long sentences you were dead you were dead in your trespasses um in which you once walked remember this is a formerly gentile um congregation right that's they come from a gentile um uh, it's the word i'm looking for culture and region you know, Ephesus is in Turkey. That city still stands today as Ephesus, right? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. They did so many things that were just not God-pleasing, you know, because they were pagan, not because they were trying to be displeasing to God. But they followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. All right, long, long sentence. Okay. Walking with someone is, you know, if you're walking with Jesus, you are living the life of faith. This, however, walking with the prince of the power of the air. Okay. This is the devil who, op who does operate in heavenly places. The church is Christ's kingdom distinguished from the devil's kingdom. And sons of disobedience is a Hebrew expression for your character. The Gentiles were disobedient unbelievers. By contrast, sons of God have God's holy character. Okay. So, living a life of sin. Sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, right? This whole church, including Paul. Paul includes himself in this, right? In the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind. If you just, like, what was the old 60s phrase? If it feels good, do it, right? That is not going to be God-pleasing. Just l doing what feels good, doing whatever you wanted to do. And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Children of wrath. All right, very similar to sons of disobedience, children of wrath, like the rest, <laughs> the rest of mankind. Okay, but, okay, God being rich in mercy, which he is, because of the great love with which he loved us, and you know, that's agape, even when we were dead in our trespasses, dead being... Um, you know, there's an argument that death is an existence without God, okay? Dead in our trespasses, willing disobedience, willing and knowing disobedience. God made us alive together with Christ. Who is the actor here? Who did this making alive? God did it, not us. By grace, you have been saved, right? Rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, he did this 
by grace. He did it. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, we did, in other words, we didn't deserve it. That's what makes it grace because we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. He made us alive together with him, raised us up with him, right? We were dead. He raised us up, made us alive, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay. We're not in heaven yet. So what does that look like? All right. Because we are in Christ, we have ascended to heaven with him. Christ's ascension was a significant part of his victory. Okay. He is with him and he, he is with us and we are with him. So when he ascended, so did we. That's what Paul's saying. So that in the coming ages, probably Paul is taking this from the Hebrew expression that we usually translate the age to come. Okay. When Christ returns, our bodily resurrection will display the fullness of our salvation. Okay. So that in the coming ages, he might show you the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Bodily resurrection, the beginning of our eternity with him in his final victory. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. All right. So we have by grace, you have been saved. Now we have by grace, you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. You didn't do it. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. You can't say, look at how look at how righteous I am. I'm more righteous than you, and so I'm saved. No. There will be no holier than thou in this discussion, for we are his workmanship. He did this. He does this with us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. We were created to do good works. But the works do not get us our salvation. Our good works do not save us. Saving comes from God as a gift. But we are created to do good works, which God prepared beforehand. Really, how did God prepare them beforehand? All right. Let's make sure I'm covering this properly here. We are his workmanship. Paul contrasts our foul works from the first three verses with God's holy work. God carries out the plan described in chapter one. Our works, however, are not the cause of salvation, but its result, right? That's what this whole verses five through nine is. Our works did not cause us to be saved. Our works are a result of our salvation. Our salvation is not a result of our works. Okay. Uh, and like I said, and here he adds through faith. Through faith means it is God's gift. It is the opposite of both works and sight. Faith is a simple trust in God's gifts now and to come. Faith is not a bare knowledge of Christ's history, but it is God's gift so neither Jews who obey the Torah nor Gentiles who heed their conscience may claim a reward from God. Christ's merit is obtained not by our works or our money, but from grace through faith. All right. So God carries out the plan described in chapter one. Our works are not the cause of salvation, but its result. We cannot even lay claim to these, for God created them for us to do in Christ. Right. So we can't even <laughs> we can't even claim that these good works are our own because God already had prepared them. Yes, we were created to do them, but it was part of God's plan and he wants us to walk in them. He wants us to do these things. It is his plan for us. Yeah. So and we'll pick up there tomorrow. <sighs> the biggest thing is understanding where our salvation comes from, that it comes from God, not from ourselves. We can't save ourselves, never could. That is pretty much the story of the Old Testament, isn't it? All right. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. 
But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Alleluia. Let us pray. Lord God, you showed your glory and led many to faith by the works of your Son. As he brought gladness and healing to his people, grant us these same gifts and lead us also to perfect faith in him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. That concludes our matins for this Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. Thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, I do apologize about last night. It's just been a crazy couple of weeks, and it's going to be a crazy couple of weeks in front of us, too. So I appreciate your patience and your flexibility. Um, we do have Vicar Rebecca. Uh, is in full swing now, uh, and I intend to start including her in these devotions more. Eventually, um, she will take a few of them every week, but uh, we're going to ease into that. Um, so there'll be a few, a few changes here and there, but by and large, we're going to try and stick to the schedule. So, um, so if you have any um, questions or comments or concerns, please please get in touch with us. I'm, I'm happy to, happy to hear some feedback. So, so, uh, we should be on track for matins the rest of the week. So, um, yeah, if there are any changes, I'll let you know. So until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.